IFC FinTech Hive's webinar Wednesdays this week. Thank you very much for dialing in. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the DIFC FinTech Hive is the Middle East's first and largest FinTech hub. We have accelerator programs, co-working space uh, for startups from all over the world, and we give them this launch pad in order to help them grow in the Middle East market. Now, Webinar Wednesdays um, is an online C-series of event that we launched in COVID this year. And the idea is to bring the community online to um, our audience. Uh, previously, we used to host these events at our space in order to have you guys come and check out our environment. But ever since COVID, we've adopted a digital approach and it's been working quite well. So thank you very much for tuning in. If you are interested in today's topic and you'd like to hear about future um, webinars, you make sure to follow us online at either Instagram or LinkedIn. We always post all of our upcoming webinars. Now, based on a webinar we did back in June, which was, which was a generic webinar about FinTech Hive and the DIFC and what it is that we offer, we noticed that without exaggeration, more than half the questions were regulation related. Um, so they were around things like what can and cannot be allowed from a regulatory point of view, how to get the regulators approval and so on. So we reached out to our colleagues over at the Dubai Financial Services Authority and urged them to do a webinar for our community, a webinar focusing on regulation. And hence the topic of today, the Dubai Financial Services Authority and the regulatory landscape within the DIFC. Now, I'm not the expert in this field, but joining me um, are three of my colleagues from the DFSA who are. They will be running the webinar. I'd just like to introduce them by name and position for now. So there is Elizabeth Wallace, who's a Senior Policy and Strategy Manager over at DFSA. Then we have Ken Coghill, who is the Head of Operational and Technology Risk Supervision at the DFSA. Last but not least, Nick Walling, who's a Senior Manager over at Supervision. Um, so they will be presenting to you the content. If you have any questions along the way, you can feel free to type them in the Q&A box. I'm going to ask you to please um, wait until the end to have your questions answered. So once all three presenters are done presenting their respective parts, we're going to have a Q&A session where I will read out the questions out loud for either of the three to answer. So you can feel free to either jot the questions down through the Q&A box available on the panel, or wait until the end of the session and type your question in there. Uh, the entire presentation will be recorded and it'll be made available on YouTube uh, once the event is over. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to the DFSA. Thanks for that, Shireen. Um, so as Shireen said, I'm Elizabeth Wallace. I'm a senior um, Manager at the DFSA in the strategy, policy, and risk team. Um, our team is responsible for a lot of the policy direction uh, that the DFSA takes. And I'm specifically, I'm sorry about that, it's my dog. I'm, uh, I'm specifically in charge of doing things around um, innovative financial services. Um, so I'll kick off and hopefully no one else decides to make it a root entry. Um, so here we go. So I think one of the things that people ask us most about is the UAE's regulatory landscape. Um, it's not easy to understand. Um, so hopefully the slide will, will um, be able to explain that further. So in the UAE, there are five financial services regulators. I've shown them on the slide there. There are two federal, uh, three federal. So we've got the UAE Central Bank, which uh, governs the activities of the banks on shore. We've got the Securities and Commodities Authority, which governs the fund management, asset management, investment side of activities on shore. And lastly, we have the Insurance Authority, who governs the insurance activities on shore. Now, there are two other financial regulators, and they're in financial free zones. So there's Abu Dhabi Global Market, who is down in Abu Dhabi, and there's obviously ourselves in the DIFC. So that is sort of broadly how the regulatory landscape looks. So back in 2004, the UAE government under the federal law established the financial free zones law. That is what effectively set up the DIFC and what has also set up Abu Dhabi Global Market. In that particular law, they uh, created the centre bodies here. So there's obviously ourselves, the DFSA, there's the DIFC authority, and there's also the DIFC courts. 
the law sets out the objectives, powers and functions of those particular entities. So in the DIFC, just to, to give you an overview of, of what happens here is that there's 100% foreign ownership is allowed. Um, it's a common law jurisdiction, hence the DIFC courts, um, uh, common law courts. Uh, the, the civil and commercial laws onshore um, don't apply. The only laws mainly that apply in the DIFC are around uh, criminal laws. We have international regulations and standards. Um, most of the, the business in the, U in the DIFC is done in the US dollar. Um, historically, we started off as a more wholesale uh, oriented centre. That has changed over the years and we're slowly getting into a more retail um, oriented centre. So, if I look more into what the DFSA does and how we regulate, uh, the DFSA has regulatory or statutory objectives. Um, and I've put some of those on the slide there. Uh, we're to protect consumers and users of financial services. We want to protect the DIFC's reputation. We want to make sure that there is financial stability within the DIFC market. And also that there's fairness, transparency and efficiency in our markets. Uh, what we do is we authorize and regulate institutions and individuals who wish to conduct financial services in or from the DIFC. We then supervise their conduct and monitor compliance with the applicable laws and legislation within the DIFC. Uh, you'll see there how we regulate. We take a risk-based supervisory approach. And what does that mean? That means we assess the risk a firm poses to the centre, and then we judge the risk to the overall market and spend more time supervising entities that pose an increased supervisory risk for us. So what activities do we regulate? Um, as I said, oh, sorry, as I said before, we were set up under a federal law. Under that federal law, there are certain things we can do and certain things we can't do. I've written what we can do on the screen as an example. We, we regulate securities, asset management, funds, crowdfunding. We've just introduced a money services regime. There's an exchange in the center. Um, all at the same time we do that, we want to have market confidence, financial stability and consumer protection. So we're always looking to our statutory objectives to make sure that we meet those. Now, I've said before, there is a federal law setting up the DIFC. There were certain things in that federal law that said that we're not allowed to do. One of them is that we don't do any direct insurance in the state. And what that means is that we don't cover any risks that are considered to be onshore risks outside the DIFC. We also don't do any banking business in the Durham. So there are banks, while there are banks in the center, and I've put banking and credit services, these are not done in the Durham. Um, so those are two specific activities that we do not regulate. Otherwise, we do regulate a broad range of activities. And I think we've probably got maybe 27 or 28 in the rule book at the moment. So a very broad range um, of activities. Uh, so as I've said before, I sit in the strategy, policy and risk team. So uh, all of the changes to the rule book or proposed changes to the rule book are made from my team. Um, we obviously get a lot of support from other teams. We don't do it on our own. Uh, our supervision colleagues, where we're Ken and Nick sit, um, we get a lot of input from them. We get input from our legal team. Uh, we also have a lot of deliberation internally before we take any policy uh, decisions or proposals uh, out for consultation. Uh, if we do then go out to consultation, they must go to our board for approval. So it may sometimes seem that our policy process can be quite slow, but we do have to we do have to cover a lot of hurdles and cross a lot of um, areas before we are able to go out to the market. Um, again, any changes we make must be in line with the federal law. As I've just previously said, you know, we don't get into retail banking in the Durham onshore. We don't cover uh, direct insurance risks in the state. So we're always careful that we, we act within the parameters of how we were set up. And lastly, and I think really importantly, is we're always evaluating the efficacy of our rule book. Uh, we were set up 15 years ago. What happened 15 years ago isn't necessarily what happens now. A lot of things have changed. I mean, you can't go anywhere at the moment without hearing things about like blockchain, um, fintech, regtech, insurtech. Um, you know, while we're a technology agnostic regulator, 
um, we also want to make sure that we are aware of market developments. And if we do need to change the rules in our rule book, that we are going to be able to do that. Um, and that would be most um, notably recently with our money services regime. Historically, we prohibited money services in the DIFC. Now we are starting to allow those types of activities. Um, so we are always looking at that. Um, so that, that's very, very briefly in a nutshell about how the DFSA works, how we fit within the DIFC confines and how we, we make rules and supervise. So I'll pass it on to my colleague, uh, Ken Coghill, who will talk more about um, what we call our regulatory sandbox, our innovation testing license. Thanks, Liz. <clears throat> So I'm, I'm head of operational and technology risk, and what that means is that my team oversees operational risk and cyber risk across all of the institutions that, that we supervise. That's the 504 regulated financial institutions that, that we authorize. But also what sits in our team is the innovation testing license. That's the, the regulatory sandbox program. So what I'll talk today is about the innovation testing license, what, how that program uh, works, what, what the objectives are for that program. So first, before I get into that, just to, to set the stage a bit for where we sit within the ecosystem in the center. Uh, Liz, can we go to the next slide, please? OK, so there's two pillars to the center, if you will. There's the commercial side, and then the, the commercial business side, and then the regulatory side. And on the commercial side, there's the DIFC authority. And within the DIFC authority, they have an innovation license for innovative, innovative companies. And then there's the DIFC Hive program that I presume everybody's well enough uh, acquainted with. And the Hive program has the accelerator program, the startup boot camp, the co-working space. And then on the other side, the regulatory side is where the DFSA sits. And within the DFSA uh, for innovation, we have the ITL program. Outside of the, of the DIFC, we also participate on the Global Financial Innovation Network, where we are, are founding members of that and members of the coordination board. And that program is about engagement with other regulators cross border and it's about supporting testing across border uh, with innovative companies and then we also have a program where we engage not just with with reg techs but with any institution that's that's operating within the center that may have a nexus with a financial service uh, we want to make sure that, that firms understand what the regulatory requirements are we want to make sure that we're aware of where there are companies that are offering services to the financial institutions that we regulate so that we understand where there may be an increased impact or systemic risk from those services. Uh, and it's, it's helpful just for the, for the sustainability ecosystem uh, to, to maintain engagement with, with all of the providers in the center. So that moves us on then to the, the ITL and then specifically talk about, about that program. So there's a couple of different kinds of sandboxes. Now we, we generically refer to the program as a sandbox. Uh, I'll say we try to not use it, but it's the term that, that most people are, are aware of. Uh, they, they vary across uh, jurisdictions and how they operate. And there are two general kinds of sandboxes. There are those that are about testing innovation. And then there are those sandboxes that are about expanding the market through innovation. On the innovation testing type of sandbox, this is where the jurisdiction doesn't issue new licenses. It's not about supporting new, new entrants to the market. It's about developing innovation within the existing institutions. And for an innovator to enter that market, they have to partner up with an incumbent. And this, this particular model would be the, the model that MAS uh, follows in Singapore, the Monetary Authority of Singapore. They'll provide waivers and modifications to an existing institution where it's needed for that institution to develop a new technology. To, to provide a particular service. So for digital onboarding, for example, if, there's, if there is a particular area of the rule where using a new technology for onboarding a client is inconsistent with the current rule, they can talk to the regulator and, 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 and discuss a waiver for that particular type of rule, enter the sandbox program, do their testing, and exit. It's about developing innovation. The other type of sandbox is about expanding the marketplace. And in those sandboxes, you can either partner with an incumbent or you can come in as a new entrance to the market. And there are two ways to do that, either through an exemption program or a license program. And an exemption style program is, is very similar to the way ASIC runs its program in Australia. You make your pitch to the regulator and they will give you a limited exemption for a limited period of time from the rules to, to test your product. Our program, you, we require you to be licensed. So ours is about expanding the market and developing innovation, but we do it through uh, a traditional financial services license and we add waivers and modifications. And I'll go through the details in a moment of what that means. So the objectives of the program, the reason that we put this in place, 
I think the, I'll start at the bottom of this slide first, the, the things we don't want the program to do. It's not about getting around regulatory requirements. Uh, there's often a, a misconception that, sand, at least in our sandbox, our, our model, that the, those that are testing or running rampant, they're not being watched. No, the, our, our rules apply just as they would to any other institution, and we still intend to maintain our regulatory objectives with the participants that are in the program. The program's not designed to give anyone a competitive advantage. So we do watch very carefully to, to the innovation to make sure that there is something that's new being brought to the market and, and not just a, a new company delivering the same service in the same way as other institutions are. And it wouldn't be fair to let, let anyone come in through the sandbox program if it's they're delivering the same thing that other existing institutions are doing. And it's not an opportunity to test the market. You, you have to do your own market research and determine whether or not this is the market for you to enter. Uh, before you get into the program. It's about testing the innovation, not the marketplace. And it's only for in, for services that require regulation. So if you're not a regulated financial service, you're not often, if you're a reg tech, for example, you don't need to be regulated, then the, then the program isn't designed uh, for that. And the program doesn't guarantee that you'll get to a point where you'll achieve a full financial services license. So we do expect firms to intend to continue their business beyond the sandbox program, but there's no guarantee that we, we will award them with a full license at the end. Uh, there are a number of requirements that have, to be, that have to be met. So the program is about maintaining a controlled environment. It's about enabling testing, but doing it in a controlled way. It's about giving a, a gateway to innovative market participants. And it's about also developing our understanding. A lot of the, the innovation is new to us, uh, just as much as it is to the market. And sometimes we need time to see how it operates so that we can make sure we have the proper supervisory infrastructure in place to monitor it uh, once, it's, once it's in full market exposure. And the program is, is to help migrate uh, successful uh, test testing into a full license. So, so that brings me to the design then of the program. So the program is, it offers a level of flexibility, regulatory flexibility in some areas. Other areas, there is no flexibility. And, and the, the base, the threshold areas where we don't offer flexibility is in AML and financial crime. All of the rules and requirements apply to, to a testing entity just as the same as they would to any conventional licensee. Uh, market client protection rules apply. So client money, client assets, you have to have proper custody arrangements in place, proper client money. Those apply whether you're in testing environment or you're in the in the regular environment. And the protections of clients, you have to you have to treat your client fairly fairly just as you would if you were not testing. The protection of the markets, you have to behave appropriately in the marketplace as though you were you were uh, a fully licensed institution. Where we give the flexibility is on the second and third lines of defense. So for those of you who are familiar with the first with the three lines of defense, first line applies. Our rules apply to everyone. Where we give the flexibilities in the second and third line in how you go about assuring that you're complying with the rules. It's very expensive to hire an independent compliance officer. It's very expensive to build out your compliance monitoring program, your risk management program, have a risk officer, have an internal auditor, an external auditor, develop an audit program. Those are all very expensive components to getting a financial service license. So in the context of the innovation testing license, we will waive those requirements for a period of time during the testing. Now there is a trade-off for that. That's a, that's a significant expense that is saved, and it's a, it's a significant burden that can be delayed for a slight period of time, but there's a cost to that. In order to make sure that we are maintaining our regulatory objectives and we're protecting clients in the markets, we will limit how much business that a participant in the program can engage in. So we will limit the number of, uh, of clients that, that you can onboard. We'll limit the number of transactions that you can conduct for the clients. We will limit the amount of the, the value of the transactions, the amount of client money that, that you can hold. Uh, that is the trade-off for the flexibility. It's a testing environment, so it, it, it it's different for every firm how much that is. So there are no hard and fast rules for how many clients we will allow you to have. It's a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, we do require you to disclose to any of these clients to deal with during the testing that, that this is a testing period. And we also require anybody that's testing to have an exit strategy. Uh, Companies do fail during the testing period. They do determine that the product doesn't work and it's and, it, and it's not feasible to continue. Well, when that happens, there are clients involved. So we need to understand how you wind down the business uh, and maintain the protection of the clients during during that testing period. The fees for the program, and this is one of the reasons we have to be very careful that, that we're not giving anyone a competitive advantage, it is very cheap to come to the program on a relative basis. It's five thousand dollars. That fee applies for the entire twelve months of the program. 
normally you would pay an application fee. There would be additional fees for authorized individuals. And then if there's any, any uh, application requirements you have for the first 12 months or any time after you become licensed, there are additional fees for that. It can easily run upwards of fifty dollars to $100,000 for, for, for an institution to get licensed. During the ITL, if you qualify for the program, it's $5,000. Everything you need to do for the first 12 months is covered in that, in that one-time uh, fee. So the program works in several phases, uh, and we've developed this over the last couple of years. Uh, it's a staged process to get into the program, and it begins with twice a year we open the cohort application process. We do one, one cohort in May, and we do the other cohort in November, and during the entire month, you have the entire month to submit the application. The cohort application is just a submission of your business model. We will do an assessment of that and determine whether or not it, it fits within the eligibility uh, of the program, and that's all that assessment is for. If if you fit the eligibility of the company, then we will then invite you, you to apply for an ITL uh, license. In that interim period, where we're when, after we invite you to apply, we will also do some training with with the applicants that we invite, and we walk through exactly how the program works, how we supervise during the program. We will walk through general supervision and our methodologies for how we do it, so that you understand how everything's going to work through the program. You submit the application, we will then do a review on the application, and if we accept the application and, and we can approve you for a license, we will then approve you for an in-principle license. And the in-principle period is then where you will uh, obtain your office space, and if you need a client money account, you'll open the client money account, you'll get your bank account, you'll apply the capital to the firm if you have the capital requirement, and you'll be given a period of time to do that. Once you satisfy those requirements, you would then move to a full license, and you begin your testing. And during that period, we would before you get the testing, we will work out what your testing plan is going to be, what metrics you're going to follow, and depending on how much business you're expecting to do, we will work out a, a map out a plan on the regulatory requirements to get you to different phases of, of business levels. So you go through the 12 months, we will monitor your progress against the plan that's been set out, and when we get to the end of the 12 months period, then you would, you would apply to exit the program. And the way you exit the program is one, by achieving your testing objectives, and two, meeting all of the regulatory requirements that we, that we had waived for you to enter the program. So what we expect is from day one when you enter the program to the end of the 12 months when you exit, you build out your regulatory compliance program. That's when you would hire a finance officer, an independent compliance officer. You, you would hire, uh, identify your, your auditors, your internal, external, develop your audit program, develop your compliance monitoring program, your risk manager program. You have effectively 12 months while you're operating to build those. We will review that, and we'll be reviewing it as, as we go along. We'll do one final review at the end, and if we're satisfied, then we remove all of the waivers. So if you're in a position where we can remove them, that is, that, that's where you would qualify to exit the program, and you would have your full license, depending on which category, whether it's, whether it's category four or category three, and you can operate as, as you otherwise would as, a, as an authorized institution. Uh, timings, uh, next slide, please. Liz. So the rough timings for, for all the stages of the program. So the application cohort uh, period is four weeks. It's one month in November and one month in May. Then there's a two-week period that we take to review the applications, and then we, we send out the invites to the, to the companies that, that we will uh, permit to apply for the ITL application. And there's four weeks to submit the application. And you can submit that yourself. You can get external uh, assistance, depending on the complexity of, of the business model you, that, that you're going to have. But there's a four-week period period there uh, to submit it, and then we, we have eight weeks to do the review for the, for the license. This part here is where this, the eight weeks is a rough timeline. It's, uh, it's very dependent upon the engagement, uh, your engagement with us during the process. There is a lot of information that we need to gather from you for the license, even though you're going into a testing period, even though we are, we are flexible on a lot of the regulatory requirements, there are still a lot of requirements that, that, that we will need to satisfy. Uh, in order to get the license. So depending on, on how well you're able to provide us the information, how quickly and how responsive you are, depends on how quickly we can get through the, the approval process for the ITL. Uh, best, case, best case scenario so far has been about eight weeks. Uh, it can run anywhere to nine months, uh, depending on, on, on uh, say, how well you're able to get us the information that we need. You then have 52 weeks to test. When the 52 weeks is up, there's another four-week period to do a final review. Uh, a total of six weeks toward the end for, for administration to get you to a full license program. So that is the, that's the overarching uh, high-level view of the program.
that's only one way to come in. That's that's through the testing license. There is the conventional license uh, approach that is always available to anyone, and, and Nick can walk through uh, what the conventional process is if the innovation uh, model, the testing model, isn't isn't appropriate. The, the conventional license is the other route. So, Nick. Um, hi, Nick. We're not Hello. able to hear you. It's, it says you're on mute now, Nick. Hi, if everyone on the webinar can just bear with us for a moment whilst Nick figures out his mic, we'd really appreciate that. Um, Shireen, um, there's yeah. some questions. Should we perhaps um, try and deal with the questions while we wait for Nick to sort out his mic? That is a wonderful idea. All right, so I'm happy to MC the questions out. Um, Liz, the first question is actually addressed to you. It's from yeah. Nadine. When you say that oftentimes considering proposals for changes in, in the rule book takes a long time, in your experience, how long does this process take on average? Okay, so I would say it would be if we want something to get through really quickly um, and it's a small change and we can put it through a miscellaneous consultation paper, probably around three months. If we're doing something large, it can take anywhere from 12 to 18 months. So for example, um, uh, when we did our money services framework, that took nearly two years to sort it out, um, just because we had to have a lot of discussions internally, take it to our internal policy committee, and then also um, deal with our legislative committee board respond to consultation uh, responses, that kind of thing. So it can be quite lengthy depending on the size of changes required. Um, but we are trying to make it quicker, but we obviously don't want to make a process quicker and not do it right. So at the end of the day, uh, we want to do it right. If we can do it quicker, that's great. If not, we will continue to do, to use the process that we're currently using. But I think that um, Nick has managed to find um, a more reliable um, uh, microphone. So I'll pass that back to you, Nick. Fantastic. And for everyone tuning in, we'll continue with Q&A once Nick has finished his presentation. Okay, can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly now. Can you Excellent. Uh, sorry about that. It's just a bit weird having a fintech-based discussion when your basic technology doesn't work. But anyway, um, hardware is not always fintech, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ken has outlined in 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 some detail um, how the innovation testing license, our version of a of a sandbox, works. Um, and sorry about that. Um, you, I think you probably got a sense from, from Ken's presentation that, um, I mean, two things really. Um, there are limited opportunities to apply for the, for the ITL, so there are, there are cohorts in May and November. Um, and then those applicants that, that, that get into the, you know, get through the ITL process, or they have to be innovative 
and then they have once sorry once they've been through the process i should say then the, the license that they operate under is is um uh, restricted in certain ways in terms of numbers of clients and, and volumes and transactions i i deal with um the standard application process if you like so the the big differences are that that uh, there's no there's no window there's no cohort we we have applications all the way through the year um and applicants who get through our application process the standard application process there are no limitations on on um the numbers of clients the volumes that kind of thing they have a standard financial services license um and 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 so we we've it's a standard process we have a standard format for business plans to be submitted to us we have a licensing team of uh, eight or nine staff who who, are, who do this full time all the time uh, and they are are experienced in handling uh, regulated applications um, we try and be as proactive and cooperative as we can be uh, for a regulator um, and 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 we try and help to uh, applicants to understand how to complete the process how to get through the process um, we obviously as, as, as Liz has already discussed there is a rule book that is um, on our website maybe it's not the easiest read in the world but it is all there we can help you look at that rule book and, and, and talk to you about some of the main points of that rule book um, we also recommend that, that where you come through the standard uh, application process that if you have the resources and the you know financial resources typically to try and use an advisory firm compliance advisory firm to help you in that process too so um you know there are we we, we try and and, and my, my job is to you know guide and, and talk to people who are thinking about making a standard application uh, getting them to the point where they they actually apply and then as i say my colleagues in the licensing team take over and do the the main uh, licensing work on, on on an application um I think the other thing that I, I, I say, and I, I spoke to an, um, a robo-advisor, a potential robo-advisor this morning, and I said to them, look, we did a robo-advisor a year or so ago in the ITL through Ken handled that, uh, and they, they moved through the ITL, and then they moved on to a, a full full license, having having come out of the ITL. So I said to the robo-advisor, look, if you're, if, if you're doing the same as before, you're a standard application. As far as we're concerned, it... it, it it, it, it's not that it doesn't matter what technology you're using and how you're using it that's obviously important but we look at financial service activities and a robo advisor is providing advice and these are arranging it, uh, deals and investments um, and we have a, a, a quite a lot of entities who do that in various different ways and we particularly you know did one uh, our first robo advisory platform um, a year or so ago that went through the itl we won't be we won't want to do another one the same because as as, as, as ken has mentioned we're looking for innovative uh, applicants in the itl not uh, applicants who are doing the same as one we've already seen uh, and so i was you know keen to point out to the applicant this morning that yes you're doing it you're using technology you've got a platform you're doing it in a different way but you are a standard advisor arranger and, and you will follow the standard uh, application process as, as far as we're concerned so um, a, a final point I would say is we work closely with the the DIFC authority um, business development team I mean Shireen knows a lot of the people there uh, and that Shireen is part of the DIFC authority of course as well uh, and very often I have discussions um, I'm sat alongside uh, people from the business side in, in the DIFC where we talk to applicants and explain both the the, the regulated process and, and the, the general process for, for setting up and getting premises and visas uh, and the like. So we, we, we try and make sure that applicants get a, a, a holistic view of, of, of what they have to go through and how long it's all going to take uh, before they can uh, uh, before they get a license. So uh, apologies again for the technical issues. Uh, happy to take your questions uh, um, as, as needs be. Nick, thank you very much. With that, I would say we can continue the Q&A. Of course, the questions can be asked for both Ken and Elizabeth, as well as um, Nick. So I'll go ahead and ask the questions. Unless it's asked of someone directly, either of you can feel free to unmute yourselves. So our first question 
comes from an anonymous attendee. How extensively are you regulating and enforcing KYC, AML, fraud, and other such areas? Ken, I think you're probably the best one to answer that question. Supervising them. There we go. <laughs> Just read that one more time for me, would you please? Sure, no worries. How extensively are you regulating and enforcing KYC, AML, fraud, and other such areas? Okay, that's a tough question only on how to define extensively. Uh, we, we, have, we have zero tolerance for failures in that space. Uh, it's probably the best way to put it. So if you're talking about the conventional model, we would require all of the, the requirements to be in place. You'd have to have need to see your policies or procedures around AML, uh, how you're going to handle onboarding clients doing the KYC and your ongoing CBD. And one of the first assessments that we will do once once you're licensed is the first couple of clients you onboard, we will come in and do a review on how well that you've assessed those clients. So a a AML, uh, KYC, CBD is, is at the top of our, of our uh, priority list. So if that helps define how, how extensively we do it, it's, it's about we will look at AML as extensively as we're going to look at anything else. All right. Thank you very much, Ken. The next question comes from Pamela. How many companies have exited the ITL program, and where can we find a list of those companies? There, there is no li public list of those that have exited, but two have exited so far since the beginning of the program. All right, Ken, we can move on to the next question. It's, it's actually for anyone to address. Um, what is the difference between the DFSA innovation testing license and the DIFC innovation license? And I'd be happy to chime in as well and answer the latter half. Okay, well, first, so our, our license is for a regulated financial institution. So if the service that you want to provide is not regulated, then you can consider the innovation license. And the innovation license is just the license from the registrar. So you might get the innovation license from DIFC and then come to us for an innovation testing license. But ours is only if you if you need to be regulated. So if you're providing robo-advisory that we just talked about, you would you would have to either come to the conventional license to get a DFSA authorization, or you would have to apply for the innovation testing license. So the significant, the significant difference is, is one is for regulated entities, the, the other is for anybody, whether you're regulated or not. And Ken, uh, correct me if, uh, correct my understanding, um, all regulated entities, meaning that if you want to be a part of the DFSA innovation testing license, would anyway need an op a, a kind of operating license from the DIFC, which would be the DIFC innovation license, correct? Correct. Great. So basically for all fintechs coming in through DIFC, you need to get the DIFC innovation license. And then only if you need to be regulated with the DFSA regulate you. And if you qualify for the ITL, then you qualify for their innovation testing license. Correct. And I, and I believe I'm not as familiar with the, with the requirements for the DIFC innovation, but I believe there is an eligibility criteria for that one as well. There is. Yes, you're right. And if anyone has any questions with that, um, you can feel free to always drop an email to fintechhive at admin at fintechhive.ae. We read everything that comes in and anyone who's interested in the innovation testing license always gets a meeting with our business development team. Um, all right, next question is a follow-up from Pamela. Is there an opportunity for incumbent institutions to be involved in sandbox testing? Pamela is one of our partners, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll, I'll quickly say, because I, I wrote the rules or the guidance for the, for the sandbox. Definitely, we always envisage that if an existing firm wanted to test a form of technology in the ITL, potentially something that wasn't covered by their license, they most definitely had the opportunity to to do that but i'll let ken also give his viewpoint on that because he runs the actual sandbox yeah if, if pamela I, I presume you're probably talking about engaging with the entities that we have in the sandbox and, and that would be something we'd have to have a separate conversation about how to, how to do that uh, as i mentioned if it's if it's for the, uh, your institution itself to test something then yes we can discuss where a waiver or a modification or a rule would be necessary for a period of time to test so we, we do it that way. Uh, but if it's about engaging with those that are in it, uh, we don't have a formal process for that, for 
as it is with the accelerator program, sort of a partnership program. But but we're open to having discussions with with existing institutions, particularly the large ones, uh, who may have uh, either a need or an interest in engaging with those in the program. Amazing. Thank you very much for the team effort answering that one. Next question comes from Sara Kalim. How does the DFSA's AML and CTF regimes tie into the federal regu regulatory framework? I can answer that one. Um, so basically, you might be aware when I said that we established DIFC, some laws apply within the DIFC. One of them is the federal AML law. So the federal AML law has application across the whole of the UAE. So our rules and regulations f follow ex basically what the, the federal AML law says, but we are a systems and controls regulator for AML. Therefore, the AML at a federal level, that law sets out the high level requirements. We put the systems and controls we think should be in place in order to meet both the federal AML law and also the 40 FATF recommendations. So I don't think you'll see a huge difference between what happens onshore and offshore. We just have specific requirements for DIFC. Some of them are slightly different and we have um, identified risks in certain areas where we want to see firms do more. Um, a lot of that's around consumer due diligence, um, but Ken also might have something else to say about that as well. I think that, that pretty well covers it. All right, fantastic. We can move on to the next question, which comes in from Aisha. How much time does it take to get the license? For the, would that be for the ITL or a conventional license? Perhaps let's answer both because it's not specified. Okay. For the, well, for both, I'm say it depends. We have, we have standards that can offer the specifics of what our standards are for the conventional. I, ITL, we would aim from the moment we get the application, our, our ultimate goal is to have it done within the eight week period. Realistically, I can tell you that hasn't happened yet with anyone. So the, the factors that control how long it takes is how well the applicant engages with us and how well the applicant is able to get us the information we need to be able to process the application. So the thing about getting a financial services application, it isn't as simple as just filling out the application form, answering all the questions, and then getting a license. We have to assess the information that's in the application. Uh, we have to do a risk assessment on it. We have to make sure that, that, that the risk is within our, our risk tolerance. And then where the risk is outside the tolerance, we have to assess whether or not the, the applicant has controls in place to bring it within the tolerance. So there's a bit of uh, subjectivity that goes on, that goes into the application process that can extend the time. So historically, it, it's taken anywhere from two and a half months up to nine months to, to get an institution, an applicant, into the ITL uh, program. On the conventional side, there, there are different different timings for different business models. Yes, uh, on the conventional side, I mean, uh, as Ken said, um, different timescales for basically, as, as, and as, as Liz mentioned at the beginning, we're, we're a risk-based regulator. And therefore, as you can imagine, the higher risk the activity, the, 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 the more effort and, and, and probably the longer it takes. So. Uh, and also, if, if a, an entity, an applicant is dealing with retail clients, um, there is more focus on that as well, because there's potentially a, a larger number of uh, the client base is potentially a larger number and, and, and retail clients typically uh, are, are not as able to absorb losses in investments and, and, and so on as a, as a professional or a high net worth individual would be. So, so it, it depends upon the activities. It depends upon the type of clients and the products that are that are being um, offered by the the applicants. Um, the simplest uh, type of application, I would say, takes us about three months to to make a decision on. But that's not the end to end time scale. Three months is our due diligence. On top of that, you you before you apply, you have to write a business plan, and we have to review it. So that takes a little bit of time, and after we make a decision, and of course, assuming the decision is a yes, um, you then have to do certain things to set up in the in the DIFC. You have to form a company. You have to open a bank account and capitalize a bank account, typically. Um, and you have to take some premises in the DIFC. So 
all of the, there's more time after the decision as well. So I usually say to applicants, assume at least a six month end to end process. Um, probably, you know, it, 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 it depends. Um, there have been quicker ones, there have been slower ones as well. But I, I would say assume at, at least six months. Fantastic. Um, the next question is also related to the ITL process. It comes in from Mahin. My question is regarding the ITL process. Once a company has received the license, can they start testing their processes out with their clients and customers? If yes, are there any limits to how many clients and customers can be used for this test? Okay, so yes and yes. So once you meet the in-principle requirements to, to get the license and we issue the actual innovation testing license, you can begin right away. As far as how many clients you can deal with, we determine that on a case-by-case -case basis. So there, there is no fixed number. Uh, by way of example, with some of the companies that we've had in the program, we've allowed them to have 10 initially and then move them to 50 and then to 100 through, throughout the term of the program. Others are, are, depending on the business model, some are business models that require scale to do testing. So we may allow them to start with 10 initially. We'll do the initial AML review, KYC uh, assessment, and then we'll allow them to jump it to 100 right away. And they may progress quickly to 300 or 400. It really depends on the underlying business model. So yes, you can begin dealing with clients right away. Um, and there, yes, there will be restrictions, but we'll have to talk about what those will be. Amazing. The next few questions are around uh, what can and can't be regulated. So the first question comes in from someone anonymously. Does the DFSA regulate digital banks? Would this fall within the ITL or the normal license? I'll start off with this answer and then someone else might want to chip in. So basically, um, as, we, as I said before, our rules and regulations are technology agnostic. If you want to run a bank and it wants to be digital, you need to meet our rules and requirements. Um, as I've also said, there are quite a few restrictions on what activities can happen in the centre. One of them is offering banking services onshore in the Durham. So you could theoretically run a digital bank in the DIFC, as long as you are compliant with our rules and regulations and also the federal law. Um, whether or not it would fall within the ITL or a normal license, I, I think that's, that's a difficult one right now. Nick or Ken might want to say whether or not they would perceive a digital bank being operational in the ITL or not. Well, I mean, I, I think I would, I would go back to my previous comment about you know, risk uh, being risk based and undertaking banking activity is the highest risk activity that can be undertaken in the DIFC in a regulated sense. So, um, we uh, and as Liz, uh, so I mean, the word digital bank, I don't know what that means. You know, JP Morgan are the biggest digital bank in the world. Um, so, so what does that mean? I mean, it, it's banking as far as we're concerned, it's the highest risk activity. Um, we have. We are very conscious of our position in the in the UAE in terms of the restriction on the Durham. Uh, in our own rules, we restrict activities that can be provided to individuals, to retail customers. And we also recognise uh, and, and value our relationship with the Central Bank of the UAE and their views on the regulation of banks that they have. So... Um, a, a digital bank, a banking activity, I could, I could not really envisage it being in the ITL scheme. It would have to be a standard application. And um, even if it was a standard application, it would require a lot of work and effort to, to, to get it uh, through the process and to get it licensed. Thank you. So moving on from what can and can't be regulated, the next question comes from Raza. Can the DFSA share some thoughts on its relationship with the DIFC's Commissioner of Data Protection and how that may develop under the new DIFC data protection law where the no enforcement holiday, holiday in quotations, ends tomorrow? Liz, that's for you. Yeah, um, I would have to say we're probably not the right people to talk about data protection because the DIFC authority they are in charge of the data protection law in the DIFC. 
clearly we're obviously interested in how it works and how it applies to uh, the regulated firms, but I'm just not the right person to answer that. Obviously we work closely with them, but you would be better to talk to the GRC authority about their data requirements, not necessarily the DFSA. Fantastic. The only thing I would add is that we will comply with the data protection law. Moving on to the next question. Thank you. Um, Nick, this is actually addressed to you. If you're already licensed in DIFC and then need to be regulated, does it still take four to six months? For example, the new market entry license where you can operate non-commercially until you need to get regulated to launch. Well, that's, that's um, a, a difficult question to answer. We, we've done it in the past, um, even before the new market entry license uh, has been a, a established or brought in. So we've done it several times over the years where an existing entity that is unregulated by us and has not been, I should, should add, has not been undertaking regulated activities without a license, you know, so they, they've genuinely been unregulated have wished to change their business model to become regulated. We've done it several times. Um, I think that it takes a little bit longer in the licensing process because we ask for a couple of extra bits of information. I mean, for instance, we need to be satisfied on the, the financial standing of the company. Uh, and so when we have a brand new applicant who doesn't exist in the DIFC, they start from scratch, they form a new company, they open a bank account and put some money in and, and off they go. It, with an existing entity, they've been running for some time, they've got a, you know, they may have liabilities on their balance sheet. So we, we, we typically ask for, for an audit by a financial uh, auditor to, to assure us that the, uh, of, of the financial standing and sameness of, of the applicant. So that could be an extra time and cost in the application process, okay? What you might save is, if you remember I mentioned after we made a decision and, and the company's actually setting up, uh, you know, establishing, taking premises, opening a bank account, of course, that all may have been done. If it's an existing entity, presumably they've already got premises, they may already have a bank account. They already exist with the DIFC registrar of companies. So they may say, save time at the end. Um, so d difficult to say for sure, but we've done it a number of times uh, and, and it's, it's, certainly, it's certainly possible. Amazing. The next question comes from Suleiman. Can a fintech startup participate in the ITL if the regulatory framework for a particular activity is not readily available, for example, digital currency? Generally, we like to wait until we have the, the regulatory framework in place, so a regime. The only exception would be, it depends on how much site we have as to when it would come into place. And stuff. But generally, we, we don't enter anybody into the program until we have a regime in place. Uh, reason being, it's too risky to the operator themselves. We, we might enter them into the program with the good intentions of, of, of publishing a regime, and for reasons beyond our control, we might not get there. And then a company is in the program, and they're effectively caught in limbo. You know, we can't move them out of the program. We get to the point where we can't allow them to continue to operate at a certain point. They may have clients already, so it, it just creates too too much of a problem to, to allow anybody and we don't have them. All right. The next few questions are around what can and can't be regulated again. Uh, so this question comes from Anonymous. Is digital wallet regulated by the DFSA? If yes, what are the what are the main requirements for it to operate? Okay, I'll, I'll have a quick go at this and I'll leave it to, to Ken. Um, as I said earlier, we created a very broad money services framework. Within that framework, there were a number of activities that are regulated. Um, digital wallet could have a whole host of um, activities related to it. There could be stored value, it could be used as a payment instrument, it could be used for um, currency exchange. We regulate a number of those activities. So I think I could broadly say probably yes, we do, but it's a number of activities that might apply. In terms of the activities then that would apply, there is lots of different sorts of rules and requirements on those activities. There's different fees, there's different amounts of capital, and there's different restrictions and conditions. So I think we can say, yes, 
but you would really have to look at our regime and a really good way of looking at what we have done is looking at the consultation paper that we did. This sets out a lot of activities in quite an easy to understand way. Um, and you'll be able to sort of figure out what you may or may not be doing within those activities. Um, Ken also might have something to add on that. Yeah, the only thing I would add is that, that there are new requirements that would apply for the wallet. And the best place to look is going to be in our, our gen module for the book and our COP module. We will find uh, most of those requirements. In addition to those requirements, there are traditional requirements that are going to apply as well because client money will be involved. So there is a client money section in our conduct rule book will apply. The, the best place will be to go to the CP because that will provide the roadmap for all, where all the rules are at. And, and there's a lot of them, so it's really difficult to sit down what the specifics are, but, but they are there. Thank you. We have another question that's coming from Reza. Does the DFSA get involved to contribute to the Central Bank of the UAE's regulatory development? I'll answer that. Uh, in a way, no because the UAE Central Bank, as I've put in the, um, the beginning slide, they're a separate regulator, they're an onshore regulator, and they monitor the activities of onshore banking and other similar financial institutions. However, we do have a lot of um, engagement with the Central Bank, um, and we often tell each other what's coming up, new areas that we're looking at. Um, clearly, AML is a one that we have a very close engagement with them on, because they are they run the, currently run the financial intelligence unit at the central bank that oversees the reporting of sus suspicious transaction reports. Um, we also engage with them very closely on um, the use of innovative technologies and financial services. So we do know what they are thinking and, and, and what is gonna be coming up, but we don't necessarily formally provide input into what they're doing. It's more a, um, a bilateral engagement between regulators in different jurisdictions in one country. Fantastic. Okay, so we have time for one last question. And this question comes in from Monica. Can you please share some information of the nature of innovations that have been accepted in previous cohorts? Some clarity on the kind of technologies would be great. Yes, we, yeah, I can absolutely do that. And, and Shereen, maybe it might be helpful if you have the mailing list. I can send you links to the media releases that we put out previously because we do in, when we do a media release for the cohort. We will say what technologies uh, were accepted, and there's there's quite a few of them summarized. So I'm happy to send that on to Shereen. She can share it with the group. Fantastic. So what I'll do is I'll maybe tie this into responding to one last question. Uh, this last question I can take, which says, can we get a hold of the slides slash recording? So for everyone on the webinar today, uh, we will put a copy of this webinar up as we do with all our webinar Wednesday webinars on the DIFC FinTech Hive's YouTube channel. Uh, just go to YouTube, uh, type in DIFC FinTech Hive and you should come across the channel. And what I'll do is the press releases that Ken just referenced, I'll add to the comment section of the video upload of this webinar so that whoever's asking the question or anyone else can have reference to them. With that, I'm very mindful of time. Uh, Ken, Elizabeth, Nick, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I do appreciate it. <laughs> you. Um, Sorry about the technical um, additions of the dog. No, it, it added character. <laughs> Keeps it real. Keeps it real. <laughs> we supervise innovation. We're not innovative. <laughs> yeah. Everyone uh, has gotten used to it. So I would say it's absolutely no worries. Thank you all very yeah. much for your time and for everyone who's tuned in. We do hope you've enjoyed it. If you want to recommend other future topics, feel free to get in touch with FinTech Hive, comment on social media, email us as you like. We do listen to you. So this DFSA webinar is brought to you based on your feedback. Thank you all very much. Have a lovely day. Great. Thanks a lot, Shireen. Bye. Bye-bye.